Um, I'm Dr. Sue Onslow. I'm the director of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies based at the School of Advanced Study in the University of London. And it's my pleasure today to chair this online discussion on China and media in Africa. Uh, this forms part of the Institute's work on the challenges to media freedom across the Commonwealth. But of course, these challenges are common to other countries um, across the globe. And so the themes, the particularities that we've investigated as part of our research program do feature in, in other media environments and in other contexts. Um, as part of our discussion, we're keen that we should now take our analysis and our research into the realm of China and the Commonwealth, and particularly China and uh, media across Commonwealth Africa. Of course, over the past 20 years, there has been um, a lot of scholarship uh, and comment on China's expansion into Africa. Uh, this has included uh, China's expansion into the media space, but it could be said as part of Beijing's outward strategy to protect its interests frontier in terms of its interests in the economic, political and strategic, um, to promote China's image and, of course, to promote its world view. Uh, a global international order which is non-Western and non-imperialist and all that that encapsulates. And I think in the wake of the crisis uh, in the Ukraine, this question of global international order and everything that this presages is particularly relevant in today's fraught times. So coming back to the media landscape across the African continent, as researchers pointed out, China's uh, expansion into um, news, the newspaper realm into editorial influence, the digital and social media landscape into radio, television, film and documentaries, as well as hard infrastructure and journalist training has been well, uh, has been covered and our speakers today will re indeed refer to these important aspects. Uh, we've asked them please if they could assess the case of China's engagement in media in Africa today. To, uh, to put it in the context, uh, because this is a rapidly changing space, and also to give African perspectives, because are the perspectives or views of China's engagement in Africa's media landscape as negative as the Western media makes out? Uh, are African elites the only positives, uh, it could be said, in terms of the positive response to China's increasing moves and investment in, in media landscapes? And what are the areas of tension? In other words, what complexities should we bear in mind, must we bear in mind, when we look at China's engagement in media in Africa? I'm delighted uh, to welcome today three speakers, all of whom have uh, detailed expertise and extensive knowledge in this particular field. My friend and colleague from the LSE, Professor Chris Alden, who is Professor of International Relations, um, and also co-director of the LSE's foreign policy think tank, uh, LSE Ideas. He's author of numerous books um, on Southern Africa, contemporary politics, society, and political economy. In particular, China Returns to Africa in 2008. More recently, he's published China, uh, I'm sorry, yes, China, Africa, Peace Building and Security Cooperation, which appeared in 2017 and New Directions in Africa-China Studies, published in 2019. I'm also delighted to welcome Ingenio um, Galelidone, um, Associate Professor in Media and Communications at the University of Svartisrand, and Associate Research Fellow in New Media and Human Rights in the Programme of Contemporary Media Law and Policy at the University of Oxford. Um, Ingenio's most recent publications include um, politi the Politics of Technology in Africa, which was published in 2016, and China, Africa, and the Future of the Internet, which came out in 2019. Thirdly, I'd like to welcome um, a, a wonderful friend and supporter of the Institute, Kayedi Soyinka, a leading Nigerian journalist, editor, and publisher. In 1995, Kayode set up uh, Africa Today, um, which is a leading African um, international news magazine. Um, he also edits it. And of course, Nigeria is a country with a very dynamic media 
well, very dynamic media industries with an S, I should say, and a regional hub for production and circulation of local and international content, of which Africa Today is an excellent example. So colleagues, what I'd like to do is to invite uh, Chris Alden to speak first, followed by Ingenio and then Coyote. Um, if I could request you to turn your microphones off unless you're speaking, I will be following the chat function. And uh, what we will do is um, allow our presenters to, to make their comments before we welcome it, uh, welcome out the discussion into the wider space, because I know that there is a lot of experience and knowledge in this platform or in this discussion, in this hybrid discussion. So, um, Chris, if I could ask you, please, to begin. Thank you very sure. much. Indeed. Thanks very much, Sue, and thanks to, to colleagues. It's a great opportunity to discuss this, this very important issue. Um, what I'm going to speak to is setting the context of China's engagement and, and the relationship with the media and its role and its media role, and uh, talk a bit about the policy responses and then uh, and or some some element of pushback. The first thing that um, I think we need to do is recognize that the media strategy sort of followed in the wake of an expansion in economic, principally in economic, but also in diplomatic terms outside of uh, China and into Africa. It's something that begins with in earnest in the 1990s, as we all know. Uh, it has a, uh, it's linked to a very large set of investments and or loan packages into the resource, resource sector. Um, uh, and with that, the arrival of, of Chinese uh, um, management and laborers and the like. Why I provide that detail is because this becomes part of the grist of the mill within the public domain about the China role, and it percolates into the media space and become, it's sort of the initial debates of China, Africa, situated around the uh, the, the presence of China and the particular role of, of Chinese labor uh, and uh, um, the like there. Um, China became, uh, China of course set up the Foreign on China, China Africa Cooperation, which became a vehicle for framing and discussing uh, the achievements and or the, the issues within African, between African countries and, and China itself. Um, in 2000. By 2006, the FOCAC had a, a major summit. This was a real sort of uh, coming out party for the relationship in a, on a global stage. Uh, much celebration in Beijing, 40 plus leaders arrive, really provides a, a very, very high mo media profile uh, for a, a relationship. And, and to the consternation of the Chinese, within a few months of that, we have uh, major figures, uh, including in the South African context, Thabo Mbeki, come back and a, a month later and say, but also in Nigeria and, and, and elsewhere, we have major figures, Mbeki saying, you know, we must be careful about China. It has perhaps impure, uh, colonial intentions here. What this signals, um, Sorry, and then Hu Jintao did a hasty trip back to, to Africa. He had just visited earlier. Uh, he tried to have a, a, an event in, in Zambia. He hosted a meeting at University of Pretoria to, to specifically counter the, the things that had been said about Chinese intentions. He tried to have a meeting in Zambia. Uh, they had to cancel it because there was public, there were concern of public responsiveness and all of this highlighted for the Chinese government, the, the fact that they really weren't telling the story of China in a way that was enabling the discussion, the, the activities uh, and interests of China to be projected and a more critical eye to uh, cast over African media, media sources, the degree to which there was reliance from outside sources, Reuters news feeds and news feeds and things like that. So that it, this by 29, uh, by 2009, we see the Chinese um, the, the, at the FOCAC meeting, uh, a very uh, deliberate and conscious effort to create programs for media training, scholarships, uh, following in the wake of that opening um, media offices, the Chinese global television network, as it later 
came to be known. Um, we have uh, laid it later on purchases of local and or um, international media groups or uh, shares in those um, uh, and all of that. So the, so the, the very uh, deliberative engagement into this area occurs in earnest in, the, in that period. And that's the, the um, period that brings us closer to the present. Um, uh, what what uh, we see in the present era um, is uh, an expansion of the media into social and activism from social media, right? We saw, we see uh, the debt, and I would point to two areas in particular that, that have shaped the contemporary response and reaction. Um, one is the uh, debt trap uh, diplomacy discourse, which emerges around two, uh, 2017, 2018. Um, a very big push from Western sources saying, you know, uh, cautioning, uh, sometimes cautioning or stride, stridently declaiming that uh, if you borrow money from China, that China will, it, it's an entrapment uh, for your economy. See what's happened in Djibouti, Zambia, Kenya, um, uh, to uh, Cameroon, etc. Um, so there was there was a recognition that there had to be a very activist countering. So it wasn't just about um, occupying a media space and telling, you know, providing news stories uh, and or perspect Chinese uh, shaped perspectives on African topics, but it was about developing a direct counter to this narrative, which was painting. China in, in, in quite negative terms and Chinese China's role. And the second one, of course, is we're still within that, that realm is the COVID, uh, the, the, the um, accusations ultimately from some sources that China was responsible for the COVID uh, crisis and the follow-up from 2020 onward through vaccine, uh, through mask diplomacy, vaccine diplomacy, to go out there and again, actively tell the story of China's interest in Africa. Uh, social media becomes an important, in both of these cases, social media becomes important. Um, the utilization of, of um, uh, what they call wolf warrior diplomacy, a much more activist engagement on the part of diplomatic uh, di diplomats, Ch Chinese diplomats, to shape debates and, and uh, uh, push back when, when they feel information is, is being portrayed, that portrays China in ill light. Um, and so this, this uh, has all uh, featured. At the same time, there's been great, uh, this kind of activism in the media space uh, of, of, of this type has, has produced some disquiet within some Chinese circles. And I think they've over, they pushed it too hard. This reactive diplomacy has been too, uh, too hard and, and uh, in, in that respect, um, there is a debate about pulling back. Xi Jinping even signaled this about pulling back from some of the more aggressive um, uh, uh, uses of, of media space to tell the Chinese story. So if that's a, a very, very patchy or potted history of the, of, of, um, the media development in line with the foreign policy uh, China-Africa response, um, what can one say about African governments in, in regards to this? My sense of things is that African governments have largely stepped aside. They haven't taken this on one way or the other. There are ruling parties and ruling party structures which have sought to embrace, right, to, to participate in or, or at least learn from uh, China's role. And in the latter case, uh, the, since, since again, uh, let's say about, the, about 2017, there have been party, lots of party to party training programs. And one emphasis of this has been on propaganda and media. So there's the training that had been formally just towards journalists is now involving party structures and, and officials. And this is an important um, way to shape, to learn from China uh, on, on how to uh, tell the story of, of uh, the of. African interest in this case, not just China, African interests um, uh, to African audi domestic audiences in African countries. So, but, but as I said, my, my sense is that there isn't any tremendous pushback. There's 
there is concern, um, I think, on a sectoral basis. So NGOs, civil society might find in particular instances issues with which they have um, uh, uh, disputes or, or, or concerns, but I don't see it as percolating up into kind of national policy directives. But that, you know, that, that that uh, we're talking about a big, a big continent with many actors and, and governments. So I think that that story uh, ho hopefully can be more embellished in greater detail by my colleagues. So I'll leave it at that. Chris, thank you very much indeed for, as you say, the, the, un our understanding of the big picture and, um, and the developments that are important background trends and the accelerate points that, that you've highlighted. Ingenio, would you like to follow that, please? I know that you have a PowerPoint that you'd like to yeah. share. Let me just try to share it now. And uh, you should be able to see it. Right, so I, I will pick up from where Chris left uh, and offering actually some case studies that uh, illustrate uh, uh, the past and the presence of, of China's engagement. Uh, and uh, uh, so the first one, uh, you know, is just a lot of logos, uh, and that's why I wanted to have a PowerPoint, so there's also a visual illustration. But it, uh, it's, it points at the uh, bigger issue, which is the tendency to point finger China and to accuse China of a lot of uh, different kind of hells. And uh, if we, uh, as researchers, as scholars, uh, policymakers, we want to find responsibility of China, we will find it. But we will also miss the larger picture of how some changes uh, uh, have occurred only in part because of China's uh, resurgence or greater interest, uh, especially I'm, I'm going to talk in particular about the digital space. And uh, so getting into, into this case, uh, which is uh, uh, taken from Ethiopia. Ethiopia is a larger context. Uh, um, uh, Huawei and ZTE have provided to Ethiopia $3 trillion to completely overhaul uh, the telecommunication space, the digital space in the country. And many would have expected that that kind of investment would have gone hand in hand uh, with uh, some proposition and some suggestion to, to, to get closer to the so-called China model, which I, I have issues with. But uh, the second part, the three part stories of this story is uh, um, we know thanks to the Snowden revelation, we see the NSA National Security Agency. And because of that, we know that the US set up uh, probably the first digital surveillance operation in Ethiopia back in 2008. Uh, uh, it was called Lion's Pride. And the goal was to have Ethiopia, at the time a beacon of peace, uh, surveilling a much more contested uh, and, and conflictual space, you see, Somalia, Eritrea, and so forth. And because of excellent work that is done by colleagues uh, at the Citizen Lab uh, in, uh, in Canada, we know that in the past, that this goes back uh, a few years, uh, the Ethiopian government has been actively uh, purchasing in the market, in the global market, uh, surveillance technology from uh, a variety of companies. But the two here are Gamma Technology, headquartered in between the UK and, and Germany, and Hacking Team, uh, headquartered in Italy. And this software was used uh, to uh, put Trojans into computers of uh, uh, opposition figures in the diaspora. So here is the paradox. If you are an Ethiopian spy, you have been trained by the Americans to use software produced in Europe uh, to harvest data in a Chinese spell network. And so you see the complexities of the set of responsibilities uh, that in this case, which is quite unique, uh, uh, lead to greater surveillance, uh, greater control, greater empowering of the state. Uh, and China has a role there. But uh, if we just focus on China, we will miss the, the bigger problem and the responsibilities. And if we care about we as citizens, to which extent we're being surveyed, we have to look uh, way beyond China. And uh, the second slide, let me see if I'm there. No, this is the third one. So this is not just to promote the book that I published. You, Sue, mentioned that already earlier on. But uh, it, it took a long time to write this book. And also because uh, I try to move away from the assumptions that uh, an authoritarian government with a very tight control in the media would necessarily act uh, in this way, learn from uh, its own uh, 
you know, trials and errors in trying to export uh, uh, this model abroad. So what I did was taking at face value some of the criticism that characterized especially the beginning of the China, Africa and media debate. So China's in involvement in this space will lead to more authoritarianism. So I, I chose uh, uh, two countries with a closed internet. One is Ethiopia and the other one is Rwanda and two countries with a more open internet that the one is Ghana and the other one is Kenya. I already told the Ethiopian story and uh, of a government of China through Exim Bank and through Huawei and ZT coming to the rescue of a very strange project, which was uh, allowing a, a, um, expansion of access in the regime of state monopoly. And only a large lender and a skilled lender, uh, well, this is the companies like China could do that. But then if we shift to two countries, Kenya and Ghana, that opened up their internet space very early on. China actually came as a very late uh, player and had to fit in a very liberalized, very open space uh, with the kind of investment that could not transform uh, uh, policies, uh, way to do things, uh, and so forth. And the cause of Rwanda is a bit more complicated, so I, I, I will discuss it in the, in the uh, uh, question and answer uh, if we have time. So is that it? You know, there is no China model. There is no uh, uh, interest uh, in, in promoting a specific view. China will just come to the rescue of whoever uh, asks for, for support in this space. Actually, not really. And, and this is another point. You know, I, uh, I still stand behind uh, the, the findings that are presented in the book. But we also need to adjust our frameworks, even if they uh, serve as well. And, and attuned them to some changes that have occurred. And this is the next uh, bit of the story. So in the past, sorry, I'm trying to go to the next one. I was just refusing to, there we go. So in the past few years, this is a slide uh, taken from a presentation of Huawei uh, to any uh, government or CT administration interest in uh, um, uh, one of its solution, which is a safe CT solution. So uh, it's known especially as for urban surveillance, but it's a lot of things like traffic control. And, uh, and in a number of reports, especially coming, the, one of the first question was how the West portrays, uh, portrays China. And a lot of reports about uh, safe CT and, uh, and smart CT, which is the CT uh, equivalent, there was a sense of, uh, you know, more of panic and doom, and uh, and the surveillance coming from China was going to turn uh, overnight uh, uh, African cities into uh, into surveilled spaces. Uh, and actually, and this is a change also in some of the Chinese actors. Uh, the the Chinese government has and diplomats have been quite silent about uh, for a long time uh, about the, the idea of a China model of how this model could appeal. Huawei and ZT have actually become more aggressive and, and implying that uh, China is good at surveillance. So if you want to purchase a system that is going to be effective, you should look to China more than to the US or to Italy or to any other country. But there is a problem here. And, and again, time is limited. Uh, despite you can see uh, the boasting from Huawei about reduction in crime and uh, the impact on, on security and, uh, and crowd controls, uh, uh, there is not a lot of research, uh, there should be more, but a lot of these projects have just failed. And uh, if you go to Mombasa, if you go to Nairobi, uh, the, 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 the correlation between uh, the deployment of, say, CG and crime is basically non-existent. Uh, crime goes up one year, goes down to the second one, and then up again. And I don't want to become too academic. There is a term that uh, some of us in science and technology studies use, this technopolitics. One thing is the is the nexus between the piece of technology and uh, social norms, what is accepted in terms of like being controlled and, and what works in Shenzhen from a social technical, social political point of view, it's quite likely not to work in Mombasa. And, and this, this obvious point is always often, not always forgotten when we look at China and, and learning and understanding how things fail even technologies of unfreedom, as they have been called, uh, can, can, can teach this important lesson in not overestimating uh, the role, the power of China, but also other actors uh, when they export their technology. And the la very last one is, is another 
kind of change. As I said at the beginning, uh, uh, the Chinese government has been silent for a long time about the China model. And Huawei and the like have become more aggressive. They're also companies, they want to sell their products. But it seems to me that very recently, also the Chinese government has become more assertive, not by saying uh, the China model is something that should be exported or others should learn from. But if we look at, and here we can become a bit technical, uh, uh, some suggestions that have been made, you know, at the beginning, China was, was, was pitching the idea of a sovereign internet uh, against the original idea of a global uh, and uh, an open internet. Uh, and very recently, just last year, Huawei started making proposition at the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, for the development of the new standard that has become to be known as new IP, and uh, which sort of takes some of the principled ideas about the sovereign internet uh, to le the level of technical standard, where it becomes quite difficult to disentangle things. It's not just a proposal when it's in our system, in our machine, uh, things get more complicated. Uh, and for the first time in history, as far as these kind of voting and participation at the ITU in the Internet Governance Forum have been uh, recorded, a coalition of African governments, 13 of them, have suggested, have supported these uh, proposals. So it seems that it's, it's a very technical matter. It's not like a big picture type of transformation, but something is changing also coming from uh, some African governments, this is very complicated. You can't just really trace the territory and democratic. It goes from Nigeria uh, to Zimbabwe uh, and, and, and started to come on board uh, into an idea of uh, different forms of the internet that privilege, privileges the control of the state uh, over others. So I will leave it at that. Uh, it's a complex space, but things are changing and are moving quite rapidly. Engineer, thank you very much indeed for highlighting the, the question of African state agency. Um, and I very much appreciate that you gave a very, very quick overview of complex, multi-layered um, developments and uh, the importance of actually looking at the specific uh, local technological environment, political environment, and as you say, this question of social norms and culture, rather than fixating on how we understand the nexus between a piece of technology and actually its impact in the African space um, isn't necessarily the appropriate way of uh, unpicking uh, the dynamics of actually what is going on in that space. Uh, Coyote, if I could ask you to pick, make your remarks, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Can indeed. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. I appreciate the, uh, the contributions of my uh, earlier uh, speakers and uh, colleagues. I want to approach this uh, from the African perspective and uh, give a bit of a background on how China was able to uh, infiltrate us in the continent. Um, when the Chinese leader uh, Xi Jinping saw the need for China to penetrate Africa um, with news about uh, China. His doctrine of uh, telling the compelling uh, Chinese uh, narrative and uh, better communicate um, uh, China's message to the world uh, was uh, the pretext of uh, infiltrating Africa uh, with the so-called uh, Chinese uh, narrative. And the driver you know, of this are the state uh, uh, media, the Chinese state media. But just a bit of a background uh, to take you back a bit. Before this latest incursion into Africa through China, uh, Chinese media, China during the time of, uh, of uh, Chairman uh, Mao had tried massively to penetrate the continent uh, through uh, printing of colorful uh, pamphlets, books, you know, cartoons, etc., targeted mainly at young Africans uh, in schools. And messages were usually to propagate the communist uh, ideology of uh, China and uh, Chairman Mao, uh, you know, himself, and uh, to educate and indoctrinate young uh, African minds about China's culture and uh, way of uh, life. Uh, this is taking you, as I said earlier on, 
uh, through memory lane, going back to the early 70s. Uh, this is important to know because it was Mao, you know, who led uh, China away from Western uh, imperialism and exploitation and created what uh, the Chinese themselves uh, referred to as uh, the new China after, after the liberation uh, of uh, 19, 19, 1949. Mao died in 1976, but throughout this time, in his, his time in power, China was very consistent in its adherence to Mao's policy. Uh, China was conservative with a small uh, C, uh, looking self-dependent uh, and inwards. It was not interested in uh, uh, then to be involved in trade uh, or relate globally, especially with the capitalist markets and uh, economies of the Western world. Instead, China wanted to be self-sufficient economically and uh, militarily uh, strong as well. Uh, before venturing into world affairs. After Mao's death, there was a short interim period uh, in search of a new leader. You know, Deng Xiaoping was the, uh, then, uh, you know, then emerged. He decided to put China on a different path. He removed Mao's self-dependent uh, policy and uh, embarked on a reform that transformed China into an economically uh, capitalist state and uh, decided to start reaching out to the rest of the world, including uh, you know, Africa itself. I mean, ironically, it was the Western world uh, that first uh, welcomed China's uh, investment in the UK. You know, here, for instance, China has uh, invested in sensitive areas like telecommunications and uh, nuclear power. Uh, China has become the main source of overseas universities, student uh, recruitment. The West has uh, you know, given priority to developing strong trade relationship uh, with China and India, a Commonwealth uh, you know, country. The relationship by the West with China has been uh, uh, welcomed with open arms and uh, you, you know, uh, heart uh, in as uh, much as China will not uh, consider the Western market as a dumping ground for inferior uh, goods. This is a very passionate debate going on about that. But the debate uh, as to whether uh, or not trading and relating with uh, China is a good or bad uh, uh, thing, is not uh, a new one. It has been going on for uh, decades now. While some have uh, considered China now an economic superpower as a force of good or a force for good, others are still very skeptical. It is uh, in this context that we have to place China's involvement with media in Africa and the Commonwealth. The initial Mao policy then to catch them young in Africa, I dare say, has been yielding some uh, uh, results indoctrinating the minds of, uh, especially of young Africans who thought China was providing them uh, an alternative to the Western way uh, of life, they already, which they already knew about and familiar with. So if China can be massively involved and invest in the Western capitalist world, the question is, why not in Africa? Uh, China has thus moved uh, on from just spreading colorful leaflets about communist China, China's cultural revolution in Africa. Today, China is massively involved in Africa. There is no African country you go to today without seeing China's uh, involvement. They have invested in various areas like infrastructure development, road construction, building railway networks across countries huge investments in agriculture start there. And in places like, uh, in a place like Nigeria, they have, uh, uh, in addition, invested in the oil uh, you know, industry. The area that uh, their involvement and, and, and investment has not been well pronounced is the media. Um, they have been very active there now. When they come into your country, uh, they will say, 
to you, uh, look, we are going to improve your infrastructure, but we will rely on you to provide us with your licenses and they will form a joint venture company with you. Uh, in most cases, because they are bringing arguably the, the dollars, the equipment uh, and uh, everything else, they use a company called Star Holdings, out of which they form a joint company, uh, joint companies with African countries called Star Times. Uh, Star Times will retain the largest equity in the joint venture company. And uh, whoever they come in partnership with will have a smaller percentage. This uh, experiment was done in Rwanda first. Uh, Star Holdings uh, came to Rwanda after the genocide and uh, linked up in uh, partnership with a local media company to start uh, Star Times uh, Rwanda. In that partnership, Rwanda, uh, the Rwandan team will have about 10% of the partnership and the rest will be uh, for Star Times. Uh, Star Times will then lay out the infrastructure. Uh, they pay for everything 100%. Uh, they train their staff, connect, connect uh, the, the network for transmission, and they can transmit all the Rwanda contents uh, through their various channels. And in between uh, that uh, arrangement, they were able to build their own uh, Chinese uh, uh, channels. Very clever uh, way of getting in there. The Star Times model in Mozambique uh, was uh, run between town holdings and the media company of the late daughter of the former president, Valentina Gubuza. Uh, she had only 5% in Star Times Mozambique. In Nigeria's case, they came to Nigeria, a leading Commonwealth country, and they formed Star Times Nigeria with the NTA, that is the Nigerian uh, Television Authority. Mm -hmm. NTA donate, donate, uh, donating the entirety of its uh, broadcast uh, infrastructure and has uh, 30%, while Star Holdings had 70%. The Star Times Nigeria was uh, then established. So Nigeria has uh, Star Times uh, Nigeria now working with the NTA. From this point, one will say that uh, they have helped the country develop its uh, broadcasting infrastructure and build up its technology. And they've uh, helped to support uh, media companies across the continent. But this is their own model. Uh, a counter argument might be, well, uh, they've done that uh, uh, with, Niger with Nigeria. They've done what uh, Nigeria itself and other African countries have not been able to do, especially with finance, building the infrastructure and uh, the technology, creating commercial activities within that and employing people which who they pay regularly. Uh, local broadcasting companies or media have problems with paying salaries regularly and making success of it. So basically that has been one way uh, they've come into investing in the media in Africa. They've helped media infrastructure. They have helped multiple media to be aired in countries across the continent. Uh, but by so doing, they also benefit by pushing their own Chinese channels, you know, into the African media market through start times. Uh, they came through Rwanda, then went into uh, went to establish in South Africa, Kenya. Mozambique, and they've been a major shareholder in the NTA in Nigeria, which happens to be the largest television station in Africa, where the West and media has failed in terms of influencing African media is that they rely on the fact that they have had Bollywood to preach and uh, sustain popular culture, which Africans are interested in. Uh, and the popularity of news led by Westerners and so on. But they have not done what the likes of uh, Star Times have done because before now, NTA couldn't transmit more than one channel at a time. 
But with start times, they now have all kinds of channels, NTA1, NTA2, NTA this, NTA that, all on start times. Uh, among others, you know, local stations like uh, AIT, TVC, and so on, they are all there. But uh, as I have said, after all this have been done, uh, they then get their own Chinese channels into the package to spread their own Chinese news, values, and culture. They now even have uh, a, new, a news channel that dedicated to Africa. So uh, across Africa, there is uh, the local DSTV from South Africa. Actually, Star Times actually came to Africa to rival uh, DSTV. But uh, where Star Times beats uh, uh, DSTV is that uh, DSTV is a, a categorically uh, 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 a channel from satellites. So it came directly and be beamed into homes. But uh, what Star Times did was to invest in terrestrial transmission, which is the fundamental kind of uh, transmission for countries. Terrestrial transmissions is uh, an uh, exclusive preserve of, of countries. I don't understand. I understand that they don't give it out to companies. That is why Star Times can come into a country in Africa, go do deals directly with the National Broadcasting Corporation, like NTA. They hold the terrestrial license on behalf of um, the country like Nigeria. So the money Nigerian government will have spent on NCA, they roll it out free of charge, you might say, to start times. That is the Chinese template for dominating media space in Africa. Koyu, thank you very much indeed for setting out so clearly the, the start times model and for, for using those examples from Commonwealth countries. Um, Ingenio, you made reference to Rwanda from your own research and perspective. And since Coyote made uh, express reference to Star Holdings and in Rwanda, which he said has left the Rwandan government with 10% um, and with 90% of the Star Holdings um, holding the, the, of, or the, the lion's share of, um, of that investment. Um, would you like to elaborate on Rwanda from your perspective? Sure, it's, it's a very interesting case because uh, when I started, when I set up this kind of comparative case studies, and I knew that there was a lot of investment in the media space in Rwanda, but actually I should have looked a bit further. And uh, because, and here's the reason, really what it makes it interesting. Uh, from some perspective, it's, I, I'm really simplifying. Out of the four countries I looked at, and out of many countries in Africa, uh, Rwanda, it's, uh, has a lot of similarities with China, definitely not the size, but in terms of the presence of a developmental leadership uh, that, uh, of course, because of the genocide and and uh, and uh, ending the genocide, gained a lot of uh, credibility, legitimacy, had a kind of tight grip uh, on uh, on uh, on a project that improved dramatically, also from an economic point of view, the life of many around. And uh, so you would expect that if China was looking to to uh, to, to transform a country as media space in a country uh, in Africa to, to look uh, as, as a model for others, Rwanda would have been a good candidate. And I'm, I'm trying to leave some suspense there. And, uh, and, and Rwanda uh, did a project that, that looks very similar to what Ethiopia did. So completely overrolling uh, its telecommunication space, going for 4G when a lot of uh, Western players were saying, uh, you're wasting your money, you have to feed your people first, why 4G? And who did that? It was actually Korea Telecom. It was in China. And, uh, and so you, you see, that's also what I said at the beginning, the assumptions and the realities. And the ingredients were there, uh, the, the possibilities were there. And if China was shopping for an ideal place to, to create these kind of waves, uh, Rwanda would have been a good place, but actually Korea Telecom for some very, um, you know, I wouldn't say random, but uh, uh, not, not particularly strategic reason. It, it was it was Korea that came to the rescue. So also we have, you know, it's it's a it's a good tale to 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 just uh, be aware of of um, expectation and 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 look on the ground. You know, the best research and COVID has got has gotten into the way. Hopefully things are better now. Uh, uh, we need 
the research is on the ground. I, I've seen a lot of the research in this space, the media China space, uh, actually being based on, uh, on I don't know, desk work expectation of China would do. But then when you start dealing with their complexity, the stories are, are so different and, and we should encourage that. And uh, hopefully COVID is in, in Johannesburg, in, in South Africa, it's, it's not behind us, but we're getting there. And, and we desperately need that, that kind of research back. Mm. Thank, thank you very much indeed for that response, Ingenio. I'm also very conscious that, that you will have to leave this, this discussion early because you do have to catch a flight. So I'm very keen that we should welcome thank questions you. to the floor and put it to you before you have to take your suitcase and head to the airport. Um, Chris, if I could just ask you, um, given your detailed understanding of China's engagement in Africa, how should we place China and its media engagement with other international players. Because uh, Ingenio has just made reference to the importance of Korean technology, the Korean model in promoting 4G in Rwanda. How much of this Western discourse of China as a ruthless player, Ch um, China, the, the debt uh, the, the debt trap that you made reference to um, that appeared in, in 2017, how much, in fact, is there a, um, a deliberate, well, not a, well, indeed, a deliberate, um, but a, a distortion of our understanding of the importance of China in Africa at this particular point and in terms of its engagement in the media landscape. Thanks, Sue. I, I think a couple of things. One is just, which is illustrative of, of this. We were just talking about Korea and earlier uh, um, Ignacio had mentioned uh, the, the standards bodies uh, or that deal with, with telecommunications, ITU and others. The Koreans in the 1980s positioned themselves very strategically within these standard bodies. And uh, Samsung was a beneficiary of some of, the, of this. And it strikes me that or at least I've seen industry figures talk about the, the, the fact that China is in, in a sense following in the wake of this, learning from the Koreans who were able to position themselves in a market very, very quick, relatively quickly. Uh, um, and this, this engagement at the, at the level of, of international institutions is credited with being part of the, the reason they were able to do so. Um, I, I, out of that, I would say is that one of the things we, we need to recognize is that it is a competitive market. China has a, a, um, a brand that is so, um, <clears throat> the, the brand of China, as I can put it that way, is so overwhelming that we, we tend to focus on it as opposed to any of the other actors that might be out there and projecting. Uh, however, in, in the context of Africa specifically, I mean, largest trading, all, all the, the statistical indicators and economic indicators uh, give us the reason why we give special attention to China. That is to say, largest trading pa partner, one of the lead investors, though certainly not the lead. Um, uh, in some economies, extremely important, a holder of large holder of debt in certain economies, not, not necessarily uh, across the whole board. Um, and it it is this uh, it is this position that it occupies, mm -hmm. and it's it has its own contrarian narrative, um, as as Coyote was saying. It wants to project a, a narrative that that has explicit uh, anti-Western. Uh, it wants to wrap um, African views in find collusion or conformity between Africa and Chinese interests. You know, and and uh, at the international stage, this plays into. Um, for those who tally these things up, it is said that this has been influential in terms of how African states uh, vote on certain certain Security Council and or General Assembly and or other measures at the international stage. I'm I'm a little uh, less certain for these drawing these direct lines, but but this is the it, for some this is what is been at stake in, in having a Chinese-led narrative on the questions of Africa, democracy, uh, media, human rights, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you very much, Chris. Coyote, if I may um, use the privileges of the chair to put a question to you. You emphasized very much 
uh, the, the film and television space. And Ingenio has emphasized the digital space. Chris has emphasized the economic space. But what about the space of and the importance of radio as the vector of communication, popular entertainment, um, and a, a platform for dissemination of, 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 all, of, of multiple ideas, norms, etc., in across across the space of that vast continent of Africa. Where do you see China's engagement in radio? Because is that not the most important platform of communication? And what, can you see China's footprints in that space? Is there editorial shape, shaping and framing? Um, do you see an impact on the training of journalists in how they use radio and reportage? So can we see it permeating the radio space as well? I was, uh... Looking at that, uh, when I was putting my proposal uh, uh, presentation together on this uh, uh, issue, and uh, and also being a player on ground myself, um, you know, in Nigeria, I could see where China um, is visible and where they are not visible, vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, other networks from the Western mm -hmm. media. And what I can say categorically is that in that area of radio, they are still uh, falling behind uh, the, the, the Western uh, media like the BBC, uh, like the CNN. Uh, mm -hmm. When you get to uh, Nigeria, you can see a physical presence, you know, of uh, you know Western uh, you know media there. I mean, you will actually be surprised. I've seen that, I've seen this before because I've gone into the offices uh, directly. Um, you will see uh, most most Western media in one block, you know, one building. You know, they are, they are together there. They are physically present, and they have what it takes to be anywhere, you know, in the country or anywhere in uh, the continent. Uh, they use Lagos as the as the hub, you know, and from Lagos they can move anywhere. And what BBC has done in the past, uh, maybe about 10 years now, is to actually break down, you know, their services, uh, you know, in a country like Nigeria. And I think they've done it in some other African countries as well. During the colonial times and up to today, there was a BBC Hausa service. Mm -hmm. you see, it has always been, uh, you know, there. When we didn't have BBC, you know, Yoruba or Igbo, you know, service. But now there is BBC uh, Yoruba service, BBC Hausa service, BBC in uh, Pidgin English. You know, I asked my colleagues in uh, London, you know, what was it behind doing this in a country like Nigeria that already has its own facilities to disseminate news in different languages to their people. I still don't have an answer uh, to that. Somebody said to me that it was a change of uh, management that brought the idea, <laughs> you know, and, but they are there and uh, people listen to them. You can't see that with the Chinese for now, you know, but what you can see uh, is the Chinese television, uh, you know, international television, their own version of uh, CNN or, uh, you know, Al Jazeera, but, uh, one thing to their advantage is that Nigerians or Africans don't speak Chinese. Uh, they don't understand Chinese anyway. So um, they are trying to take some of our professionals uh, to China uh, to train them. Uh, but still, I don't think they will be as effective for now when it comes to radio, like uh, the Western uh, media. Mm -hmm. Colleagues, I'm going to open the discussion up now to the, the chat. And um, because we've got 29 people on the call, I am going to be crossing between screens on my laptop. So please, if I could encourage you to use the chat function as well as raising a yellow hand on your, uh, on your particular icon on the screen, um, I'd be very grateful. Um, if I could just, uh, while you're composing your questions, um, if I could put one more question to Ingenio, um, if you could talk a little bit more about the comparative, the Ghana and the Kenyan space, you talked about these being different, um, different regulatory environments, different uh, with, with, with much freer, uh, it should be said, 
um, more competitive licensing arrangements, um, stronger regulatory uh, frameworks as well. Um, has this also helped to um, well, oblige China to, uh, or Chinese actors in this space to respond in a different way? Have they managed to penetrate um, uh, the media discourse in terms of journalist training, um, in terms of editorial control, um, dominance of, uh, of investment um, in, in a, an appreciably different way? Well, it's again, it's it's a complex picture because as some of us said, uh, you know, China when they started CGTC, CCTV Africa and CGTN, they chose Kenya, and uh, because mm -hmm. of uh, the very clear understanding of the complexity and and, and uh, how advanced the, the market uh, there is in terms of like training of journalists and so forth, so uh, they didn't choose Ethiopia. That was a country that was supported from the digital space in different ways. So sometimes there is just you can create some connection with a very complex puzzle. So it's very difficult to, to, to point at. And uh, I don't wanna, I see there are a couple of events and I don't wanna use too much time, but also one thing that it's, uh, I've always been resistant to, to uh, um, some colleagues suggested the idea of a cold war between the US and China in the digital space, uh, or I've mentioned the, 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 the creation of a splinter net. So one dominated by China. And, and I've always pushed back in this regard. And I say, well, it's more complex. First of all, and I'm still pushing back because it, it's what you mentioned before, African agency completely do it, does away with the idea of African agency. You know, it's not the Cold War where in the, if, if you side, if you use Chinese technology, you're, you're stuck with it. You have to choose. There is a lot of mingling and interconnection. And there's a lot of ideas that emerge from the continent. So it's not like you have to choose one camp or, or the other but things are eating up you know i don't want the itu is not the most interesting place to have conversation a lot of time is quite boring and very technical but but the, the internet governance space is, is indeed changing and, and we might see countries like in the voting kenya and ghana not just following what has been historically their their their, their social political technopolitical progression but also having to stand up for a certain vision and uh, and we will only know as as things progress. But but uh, it, it's it, it's not just the point we're trying to make. It's not that Kenya and Ghana forcing Chinese actors to adapt to their, but up, all, also stepping up at a at a global level in order to protect the certain ideas versus another one. But again, it's very early to to tell what what's going to happen next. No, thank you very much for that. Um, a question from Silas um, Udense, please. Silas, your microphone is off. Okay, I think can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. It's quite an intriguing uh, conversation from the three discussions and uh, their perspective is quite interesting. Now, I, uh, I think I will direct my question to Iginio and uh, Chris. Uh, I, I, I remember Iginio mentioned the um, phenomenon of techno politics. And um, if I may ask, uh, would it be possible to, to say that uh, China, on its own part, uh, discovered Africa, African media space, as some sort of virgin land for them to go first before other Western countries could penetrate that space? Because we know that to a large extent at this moment, China is technological advanced because I'm from Nigeria too. We know how it was difficult for us to access mobile phone at first instant, but, but with, the, with, with the coming of Chinese industries, mobile phones became so cheap that we could afford it. Now, the West could not give us that in code, but do you think that the continent Africa was discovered by China as a, as a virgin area where the, the, the went first, giving them this, this, um, this name of China model, because for me, I believe it's like a technological war that the West could not go first, but China was able to go first. Now, they see China as being indoctrinating and all that, but I mean, from my own perspective, I, I don't know what both of you have to say about that, but I think they discovered China first, uh, Africa first, before the West could actually come there. If you can give me your perspective on that, thank you very much. So that was a question for Chris Silas. Yeah, Chris, 
Chris or Ignacio, any of them could. Okay, colleagues, if you'd okay. like. I'll jump in then. And, and just very quickly, I think that, that I would read it in a slightly different uh, language is the sense of, I would see there are market opportunities and that they had a product that uh, could be, uh, I, I think that this, you said sort of virgin territory, I think it was certainly um, uh, fewer actors were available and there was not the resources there. Chinese firms recognized these market opportunities and were building, they were underwriting and building communication infrastructure, the, ver the very sort of initial ZTE and, and the like, um, and, the, and Huawei as well. And, and out of that, that um, uh, was a receptivity to the pricing of this, coupled to the underwriting of, of uh, um, expansion of, of basic and necessary IC ICT um, infrastructure for, for building phones and the like. So I think there was that, but there's, it was competitive. There were other actors as well, I think regionally defined. I don't know, uh, Ignacio, maybe you can elaborate further on that, those points. And uh, in a way, actually, I, I think that in, in, in the television space, for example, China came really late compared to others. You know, uh, they stepped up CCTV in 2011, 2012, where the, the vibrancy of, of the Kenyan media was just, just offering very good quality content to Kenyan uh, um, uh, viewers and audiences. Uh, you know, B the BBC, we don't have to, to, to remind, it was just already reminded when, when he uh, started and the complexity of the variety of languages, you know, Maharik and others. And, uh, and so uh, uh, the Virgin Land, I, 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 and also in the digital space, I think when it comes to um, uh, um, coming to Africa, we, we forget some time that, um, African leaders had to come together to obtain what others didn't want to give them. And the first uh, uh, um, um, undersea cable that were built uh, were built by a coalition of governments uh, in different parts of, you know, in Eastern Africa that were coming together in Southern Africa because there was no interest in, 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 in providing that infrastructure despite all the narrative about the digital divide, the digital. And now we have China with peace is one large undersea cable coming in and connecting Google and Facebook doing their own thing. But uh, it, it seems that maybe not in terms of size and enormous resources, but African actors came together with an idea of what some of them wanted before this large player. And, and as Chris said, you know, China is so big, it's such a big brand. And then when China comes, it almost obliterates the smaller stories that have made uh, the continent and the history of the media and the continent. And, and, we, and we get sort of like, the US is enormous, China is enormous in different terms, and, and just we get distracted. And, and, and there are big players with big consequences, but there is also the importance of it's definitely not virgin. There was so much going on, uh, and, and that history has to be kept and, and narrated uh, rather than forgotten because of these big uh, uh, processes and forces at play. If I may just add a point, uh, you know, there. Um, to, in a way, um, explain why it, some people might think uh, Africa is a virgin land. It's looking at the political, you know, aspect, you know, of this because uh, it's like uh, Africa was abandoned and just left, you know, flowing when the uh, West uh, was uh, looking at. Uh, the East, there was a time when the attention of the West it was towards uh, you know, the East. And then the United States uh, were very busy uh, fighting uh, you know, costly wars you know, around uh, the world. And China was looking you know, at this vast continent that was just there, that uh, nobody was interested in. You know, and they took advantage you know of that and uh, my compatriot from nigeria silas is right how do you compete with uh, a country like uh, china in a vast market like nigeria when they bring their products and then their prices are you know cheaper than, than, than yours all we need to do to take advantage of uh, china 
and its involvement in Africa uh, is to do what the West has done in terms of quality control. You know, I mean, we cannot be told by the West not to accept China. I, I, I had a conference in Abuja about three years ago on China, Africa, and I, I brought into Nigeria the former minister for uh, trade in the UK, um, uh, Sir, uh, what's his name now? I can uh, remember, leader of the Liberal Party, uh, former liberal of the cable, you know, Vince Cable, uh, to be the lead, you know, speaker. And he, he, he was a trade minister in the UK for five years, he, you know, he dealt with China. And that was the reason why I thought he had the qualification to speak, you know, about, you know, China to us. And I, I was surprised when he said, look, I'm going to be neutral, you know, here. I mean, we dealt with, uh, you know, China. Um, China is involved, you know, in our sensitive areas like telecommunications, like the nuclear uh, in, in, in industry. He would not advise that Africa should not deal with, uh, you know, China. So that's the reason why I think uh, the West at one time were interested in the East. Yeah, look, at ironically, what is happening now, you know, in the Western plus and the Eastern Europe platform with the war that is going on in uh, Ukraine. So um, it is the West fault. They are very expensive to deal with. If, if it comes to us going to the West to ask for loan, they will ask for all kinds of conditionalities and so on you know, to get loans. Uh, but China, their loans are, are very cheap, whatever you uh, want to say about that. That is one point I want to add to the point raised by my friend from Nigeria. Heidi, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Kieran, you have your hand up. Um, would you like to put a question? No response from Kieran. Kieran, I'll come back to you. Um, Sally Ann Wilson, you have been making some very, uh, very shrewd and, and concise comments in the chat. Would you um, we very much welcome your viewpoint, please, as former CEO um, of the uh, Public Media Alliance? You I, just I, just stepped down, I believe, Sally. No, no, I'm I'm actually still CEO of Public oh, Media, I but I have until Thursday. Oh, um, okay. I, I mean, <clears throat> a number of things here, and thank you all. It was very insightful. Um, I'm not. From Africa, so that inevitably influences uh, my comments. But I have worked in Africa, uh, many countries, um, since uh, for the last twenty odd years in the in the media space. Um, and I and I, I would query when um, the comment Chinese loans are cheap. Um, I can only go by the evidence of my own eyes. I've not engaged specifically in research, although I've read many many research papers on the subject. Um, I'm not sure it's cheap as a loan when, for instance, with Tanzania, which was one of the first countries to go digital, uh, and this was done with a soft loan from China, where, um, as was pointed out, the actual um, way that the ownership of the, of the loan works and the, and the ownership of the new company uh, means that 45 million people in Tanzania can have their media switched off at the flick of a switch, because if, the, if there's a default on the loan, then China owns everything. I think it really depends on, on values. And I, I think we have to go back quite a lot further than we've talked about today in that China was undoubtedly a very effective partner and media partner and supporter uh, pre-liberation. I think China Radio International was broadcasting in something like uh, 60 odd languages, even in the late 1940s. And so there's a familiarity with Chinese media content in many countries and the, the, the Chinese present. It's, it's not a virgin land, China has been in, in active in the media in many countries for, for now many, many years. Where it changed was the, um, as Chris pointed out, the, the, the FOCAC and, and the early 2000s, China's realization that its, its uh, media power and its soft power didn't match its economic power, which was growing very much worldwide and, and specifically in Africa. At the same time as the economic crash in the West 2008-9 meant that the media development work uh, across Africa from the West failed because they didn't have money to continue it. Um, I absolutely and, and always believe in, 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 in and, and, and support wholeheartedly more African agency in their own media space. And I'm always saddened that we haven't seen more African agency in media space, 
because now the technology is cheap everywhere um, and cheap enough for um, media talent to come out and and to push for doing things in a different way, even if it's the shaping of programmes. You know, why, why I've stood on stage many a time across Africa and said, why, um, when this is the country where storytelling is inherent, this is the continent where storytelling is, is, storytelling is just there. Um, and it's, it's the longest history of anywhere in the world of storytelling. And yet so much storytelling still fits a, fits a Western model when it goes out in, in, in TV and radio. Why does it have to fit the same times, the same need for advert breaks? Why not reinvent the African media space, which I wholeheartedly endorse? I think I would disagree with Ingenio over, over Korea not being strategic. I think both Korea and Japan have been strategic in their media interventions in Africa and alongside the ITU. Um, I agree the ITU is not a place for a laugh a minute, but it is actually a very powerful place for setting media standards. And so the influence of both Korea and Japan there alongside China uh, to move that as a, as a UN organization to an area that supports a lot of what is happening in terms of others development in the media space. I saw a comment about it being a good thing that the Chinese model um, to um, Star Times model, I would disagree with that because actually there is a lot of um, uh, control in media and I have confronted that myself personally on many, many occasions. Those of you may wish to push back on the idea of editorial ind independence. Um, as a Western ideal, but I say it underpins democracy and should be relevant in the Commonwealth and beyond. And the idea of independent editorial um, has been severely damaged across Africa by China's role in recent years. Um, and also that's happening in the Caribbean and the Pacific, although there's a pushback in the Pacific at present and is already established in, in, in Asia. In Asia, we see most national media as now being there for cultural and uh, disaster warning purposes, but not to promote editorial independence. And I think in countries such as Nigeria, with such a fabulous history of writing and editorial independence and print, and we haven't really talked about the print media, mm -hmm. then this is, is an area where um, it really could come out much more strongly. And, you know, I know NTA were our members. I worked with NTA until China became involved. And then, as in so many countries, I, I talk to people I work with every day who are told that Western media, public media is about, um, in, is about independence, it's about democracy, and that is a bad thing. And those conversations have been had. I've been present for those conversations. So it's not just, um, you know, to go back to Ingenio, it's not just looking for an, an argument and, and sitting with the, with the argument that, that um, we're all looking for China to be different and that the Western media are there to contradict this, this narrative of China's growth in the African media space. You know, it is, it is absolutely a reality and one that I have lived with for the last 20 years, uh, moving from country to country to country, whether it's Star Times saying, we're going to pay to have this function where all the dignitaries can come, um, all the government leaders can come, we'll pay for everything that would have been paid for by Western media development agencies in the parts to support. And the conversation, the narrative has totally changed. So um, I'm aware some of you may want to come back on some of the things I've said. I have plenty of other examples and papers that I can point you to, but I'm saying from my own eyes and ears of being there at these major media meetings um, in Namibia, in Mozambique, in Kenya, in Nigeria, in Ghana, in South Africa, in Lesotho, year after year, that is what I've seen happening in my own eyes. And of course, there's a market response. I mean, I think um, the question from CSE, um, you know, absolutely China was able to step in with cheap technology. But I think the fact that this is a cheap option is probably an underestimate of what's happening. And, and I really would hope to see more African agency in, in, in African media space continent-wide. Sally, thank you very much indeed. Um, Ingenio, Chris and, and Coyote, would you like to respond to any of Sally's remarks? Or shall I continue with the questions? No? I, I'm fine. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Um, right, if I may, uh, Kieran, you, you raised your hand. Yes, uh, thank you so much uh, to Sue and all the speakers for a very, very constructive kind of conversation. 
on a very much needed topic. Uh, I've got a couple of questions if, if, if Professor Ingenio is still around. Um, one is if he would like to, uh, you know, throw some light on the BRI digital Silk Road, which is Pakistan, East Africa connecting Europe, peace cable by the Chinese, uh, which is a relatively new endeavor. Uh, this has uh, this is a digi digital infrastructure which is very connected to the BRI, um, uh, which which has to coin the BRI initiative or uh, aspirations of the Chinese government at the moment. And equally, I would also uh, perhaps you know think about what Sally has put in some of the questions because we also need to actually have a kind of much more of a broader view of within the Commonwealth, whereby China has, uh, has already made some very significant inroads within the media industries. Uh, and my kind of focus would be possibly a comparative analysis. We have actually worked for at China's uh, making these kind of infrastructural as well as cultural inroads as within Pakistani media. And I know that they are, have been doing the same similar engagement with Bangladesh, as well as Sri Lanka as well. And these are Commonwealth countries. So um, in all these, if, if the, if the, if the uh, Eugenio can talk about the peace table and, and the rest of the speakers, if they have any kind of like uh, comparative analysis on the broader kind of uh, digital as well as cultural infrastructure, uh, which China is really, uh, that's the kind of backbone of their kind of strategy for the 21st century. If any comments on that, that would be very welcome. Thank you. Kieran, thank you. Ingenio, I know that you're, yeah. you're literally- We'll be brief because, yeah, I really don't want to, if the flight is, <laughs> literally is back to Johannesburg. Yeah, I'm, so I'm holding it. Make, I'll phone them, I'll hold it. <laughs> So on, on the peace cable, I will be quick. I mentioned it uh, before, and uh, and the, the digital Silk Road. To some extent, the digital Silk Road is, is just a new brand on on a on a longer engagement. As, as we said, you know, Chris mentioned the, how things got heated uh, in the two thousand and and later on. Um, and uh, the fact it's called peace uh, has also uh, is sending a message. And, uh, and 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 my point is also putting it again, into the greater context. We have peace coming from the East, but we also have, for the first time in history, the, uh, the, the, the digitally material big player, Google and Facebook, taking an interest uh, into brick and mortar infrastructure. They try with like fancy, disruptive Silicon Valley balloons, beaming internet and those from, from the sky and it failed. And they're docking the two largest undersea cable uh, both of them larger than peace uh, uh, coming from the other end. And, but there is a difference there. And I think peace is, is a strong diplomatic effort that also comes with some interesting technical complications and you know there's no time to look into it. But, but it's been presented uh, a kind of, uh, uh, again, in a kind of a soft uh, manner and not like this is the, the gift of China to, to Africa, to some extent, there was there's some of it. Well, if we look at Google and Facebook, uh, they, they have revamped the, the stale entire trope of uh, we are coming to help poor Africans. If you go on, on the Facebook page, first of all, the first time they called the cable that's called to Africa, they call it Simba to show you how much they know Africa, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they, you know their exposure is just through Disney movies rather than uh, uh, Google was smart and called it a Keanu. Our Nigerian colleagues knows uh, uh, how was uh, uh, an activist uh, uh, and uh, instrumental to liberation. So, uh, and and again, uh, uh, it's uh, we have also scholars to 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 push back against this narrative of uh, African as the least frontier, the last continent. Uh, it's 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 market. It's it's the largest. You know, they will have the, one of the largest uh, youth. Uh, audiences and, and users of digital technologies. There's a lot to try and, and a lot is already there. So uh, it's it's complicated. And again, if we we should look at China plus all the other actors that are occupying the space uh, and not forgetting that the, the many African actors and innovators that, that are doing 
quite a lot these days. We're not in 1995, where, where the, the, the UNECH had to, had to create a, 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 the internet for the whole continent. It, it's, it, things are very different. And thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm really sorry they have to rush. It's yeah, a, for yeah. a good reason. Yeah. Well, and thank you very much indeed on behalf of everybody here. So please do leave. Thank, thank you very much. Bye -bye. Um, <laughs> Coyote, would you like to respond to, to any of Kieran's uh, remarks? If you feel that it's relevant to Nigeria or to your, to, um, how does it chime in with your, your deep knowledge? Well, not, not, not Nigeria, um, these days, uh, it's neutral, you know, on some of these, uh, you know, issues because of the nature of the country itself, uh, very close to, to the West, very close to um, the East, uh, the, you know, very close to China. Uh, China has done wonderful things, uh, you know, in Nigeria, uh, especially with uh, uh, construction of, uh, railway uh, net, network. Mm -hmm. uh, they've done well, even in the private sector uh, as well. Uh, Chinese people are involved uh, in real estate, you know, construction of real estate across the country. And you'll be uh, amazed uh, to see their involvement in agriculture, uh, you know, uh, for, 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 for instance, these are things that are outside the media space. So whether we like it or not, they have become, you know, a way of life, uh, you know, more or less, uh, you know, in the country. And I believe it's the same uh, in a lot of uh, African countries. What I would advise, um, which, uh, you know, some speakers, have also acknowledged is that it depends on each country, uh, mm -hmm. the kind of relationship you want to have, uh, you know, with China. You know, we have had experiences with the West and the institutions like the World Bank and IMF, and they are not all, you know, clapping our hands and say they've done well uh, mm -hmm. for us you know, mm -hmm. so trying another alternative is not a bad, you know, idea, uh, you know, in Africa, but each country must be very careful, um, must be knowledgeable in the kind of relationship they are having uh, with China, so that uh, we will not have the example that was cited earlier on of uh, Tanzania, you know, having a bad, uh, uh, experience, uh, you, you know, with China, but there is quite a lot of uh, benefit that we can actually uh, get uh, from China. I can see that in uh, what they, they have contributed in uh, Nigeria, and uh, when we do have problems uh, with China, I think uh, we should be strong enough to face them and confront them and ask them, you know, to review, re review our situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If I could then just going through the chat, um, David Page has a question. Would it be true to say that China generally works through African states and African state media and that its equipment and technology generally serve to strengthen states with authoritarian tendencies, but are less effective in countries with more liberal governments and more diverse media? Um, and so in other words, are we seeing China as an enabler of authoritarianism and state propaganda? or in environments where there are stronger parliamentary systems, regulatory environments that the, uh, and a more, okay, a more diverse economy, that in fact, it's, it's an appreciably different picture? Well, um, I come from uh, a background uh, in journalism in Nigeria, as you alluded to when you introduced me. Nigeria has, uh, a very vibrant uh, media, not just uh, uh, electronic, uh, but independent uh, media. And I think uh, the vast country, as you know, mm -hmm. with 36 uh, states, uh, 
213 million uh, you know, people. Um, the federal government at the center cannot, even if they want to, control all Ni Ni Nigeria. All the states you know, have their own uh, radio and television stations, but individuals you know, have their newspapers, independent newspapers and uh, independent radio stations. Licenses are given out by government to independent electronic media and uh, TV stations. Um, but I think uh, I will be right to say that uh, within the limits, the uh, independent uh, uh, electronic uh, media, radio and television are doing pretty good. Uh, they, they, know, they know the limits and you've got to get to a higher standard of journalism or uh, broadcasting to be able to maneuver around uh, difficult situations uh, uh, like this. And I think we have managed it very well. So I cannot see any Chinese uh, uh, influence of note in the independent uh, you know, media you know, in Nigeria, or should I say even in other countries where an individual has invested so much of his own money you know, in setting up a news, a, a, a television like like AIT, you know, for instance, in mm -hmm. Nigeria, or Channels TV, you know, in Nigeria. I I, I know the owners, and not, they are not the type of people, you know, who will be influenced either by the West or the uh, mm -hmm. uh, Chinese. Um, Chris, do you want to add any anything to that re response? Or shall I go to the, the last question? I'll just one sentence, which is that I think there is a <clears throat> there's such a variety of governments and regulatory regimes that, that, mm. that we almost are going to have to look at each one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in its own. So. Yeah. No, no, thank you. Um, argument for complexity. Um, Nicholas Watts, if I could ask you to put your question about China's influence on media content. Thank you, Sue, very much. And to the speakers. Um, yes, I'm just interested in whether and how China uses its influence over African media to uh, influence the African narrative with regard to climate change and the UN Oceans agenda, especially with regard to illegal or industrial overfishing, um, given the impact on African livelihoods and Chinese agency in uh, through extractive industries and and it, and overfishing in actually doing the damage that that they do do they try and influence that narrative mm, so very much uh, taking part in we, internal domestic tensions between elites and and communities at lower levels who may be at the, at the sharp end of, of extractive practices um Kayudi, would you like to respond to that please it's interesting that that is mentioned um, because it's an area that uh, we haven't looked, uh, you know, at, mm -hmm. and um, I, I know that uh, African countries have serious problems, especially with the extractive industries, uh, mining, um, you know, for, for for instance, has done us uh, terrible things in uh, Africa. Uh, look at what is happening in the uh congo for 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 for, for, for instance uh, it's not uh, something that uh, uh we look at uh, li lightly um chinese people are involved you know in serious mining uh, you know in 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 africa that's one area i haven't studied it studied myself uh, uh very well but uh they are there. Um, we have issues of illegal mining, uh, you know, in, in, in Nigeria. That's, that, 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 that's a lot there. And we have found some Chinese people uh, mining, uh, whether they have license to do that, you know, or individuals are bringing them into the country. It's another question that we have to uh, uh, look at. And uh, also even this issue of licensing them creates a problem uh, for 
a country like Nigeria because uh, of the way our laws are set. You can get a license uh, from flying from China, go to Abuja, get a license from the federal government. Um, and then that license, you can use it in a particular state, you know, where you have found the land to, to, to mine. But it doesn't mean that because you have gotten the license in Abuja, you can start going to mine in that particular state because the governor of the state has the right to give you access to the land. You know, so the, the uh, power to give license is in the exclusive list, you know, of Nigeria, which only the president, you, you know, can uh, operate. Uh, but then, you know, where the irony is, is that it doesn't hold any water because you still have to go to that state to be able to get permission to use that land. And it is the governor of the state that has the right, you know, to give permission for the land to be to be used. So mm -hmm. these are some of the issues, you know, we have. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, the Chinese are also very much involved uh, in mining. No, but thank you, Coyote. Argument for further research. Chris, do you want to add anything or? No, okay. Um, colleagues, I'm very conscious that we're now on the hour. I know there are, there are further questions, but um, we were going to run two, two o'clock, and, uh, and I'm afraid we've run out of time. Um, I would encourage you, please, to put your questions, which I can send on to, to our highly uh, knowledgeable speakers. But I'd like to thank Ingenio in absence, who's now sitting in the departure lounge, I hope, um, Chris Alden um, at the LSE, and Coyote um, Soyinka in London for this um, wide ranging discussion, which has emphasized the importance of historic roots, continuities, accelerants, um, and it's ranged from techno politics to investment patterns to business investment models, the importance of complexity and thinking of multi actors in media spaces in specific countries and that the perspectives of elites may differ fundamentally from those engaged in the media sector compared to those elsewhere in society. So I appreciate on such a vast topic, we've only been able to uh, touch on issues rather than dive deeply into them. But I think we have had a very stimulating discussion, which has been extremely wide ranging. And um, I would like to thank our speakers and to um, those in the audience who have put such interesting questions, particularly Sally um, and your um, extensive knowledge that was um, enormously valuable in reading that into into the narrative of this recording. So, um, colleagues, with that, I'd like to draw it to a close.